the decision about how to reopen is a political one more than a medical one because it is about risk that you can look at the data on deaths, you can look at the data on infections, but ultimately it's going to come down to how much risk the prime minister and the government are willing to take with the virus spreading around the economy. You know, where do you think the acceptable level of risks for daily deaths is, for example? Well, it's part of the reason why I want to debate because it's something that society is going to have to settle on. But I mean, the chief medical officer said that every year, in a normal year, we get between seven and 20,000 people a year die from seasonal flu. Now, we do what we can to protect people. We have an annual vaccination programme. But we don't shut down the economy and shut down people meeting with each other. Now, even when we vaccinated everybody, there is still going to be some risk and some people dying from COVID and some people being hospitalised with it. And as a society, we've got to settle on where do we think that balance is. And I think that's why we want the debate. It's a debate for MPs and politicians to take the decisions, but it should be informed by input from the public, from wider society. For myself, I think once you've vaccinated certainly the top nine groups and you've reduced 99% of the risk of death and you reduce the level of hospitalisation by 80%, you'd struggle to make an argument for having any restrictions in place at all. But look, I may be wrong. So I, I want people to engage in that debate. So according to Public Health England, on average, there's about 17,000 people die from the flu annually in England. You know, Do you think that's the kind of level we need to be looking at to get back to a normal society while living with COVID? Or should it be lower than that? That's, I suppose, a good benchmark in the sense that That's what we currently live with and what we currently appear to be comfortable with as a proposition. But I think life has risk in it and it's about balancing risks and looking at the costs and the benefits. And we've seen that locking down the economy has massive costs. We hear every day about the damage to young people's education and life chances. And many young people are going to be living with the consequences of the year of school that they've missed for the rest of their lives. And that's going to have not just an economic impact on them, but it's going to have a, an impact on their health. And we are going to see over the next few years, massive impacts on the economy and on the public finances. And that won't just have an economic impact. We know that will have a negative impact on people's health and well-being. So it's about balancing these things. Now, there has been some criticism of the COVID recovery group because obviously we hit that 100,000 milestone we mentioned this week. And some people are saying that we rushed out of the lockdown in November. We shouldn't have had the Christmas bubbles. The fact that 60,000 of those deaths happened since November are linked to that situation. Do you think there's any sense that the CRG's lobbying to ease restrictions led us into this situation? Because you are a very influential group and the Prime Minister does listen to what you guys say. Well, look, let me take this one head on. If I go back to November, when we were having the debate about the second lockdown, my argument at the time was about the government being open and frank with us about the data. And I think at that time... We weren't seeing that level of transparency about the data. And I'll take your listeners back to that weekend we had where it looked like the Prime Minister was bounced that Friday, Saturday into that lockdown. Information was leaked to political journalists about the state of the health service, for example. And there were scary slides produced suggesting that the NHS was going to be overwhelmed within a a few weeks. But when the Prime Minister had his press conference on the Saturday, no such information was published, and the government couldn't stand any of it up. And I said in Parliament at the time, for me, if the government had been able to substantiate those concerns about the health service, that would have weighed very heavily for me. And I may well have supported that second lockdown. But I don't think the government did bring that information forward at the time. And that's why I didn't support the second lockdown. I've always been driven, I think, by the evidence and challenging the government to bring forward the arguments and be as open with Parliament as possible about the data on which these decisions are being taken. And I don't think the government has always been as transparent as it could have been. And that's really what we've been asking for. 
But when you look at the evidence we've seen, you know, the dreadful scenes from intensive care units over recent weeks and the fact that the NHS has become close to overwhelmed in some part during the third lockdown, doesn't that suggest that back in November, when obviously things were starting to take a turn for the worse and the new variant was starting to spread, although we weren't aware of it yet, we should have stayed locked down. And even if the government didn't publish the data, maybe you should have trusted the prime minister on that. That assumes, of course, there are no costs for lockdowns. Because in the first lockdown, perfectly understandably, because we had such little data, we effectively shut down the NHS in advance and we cancelled a huge number of operations. We cancelled screenings for serious diseases. We did effectively scare people away from attending accident and emergency. The government's own analysis has concluded that the impact of the first lockdown in terms of you know, in the jargon, quality adjusted life years, years that people have in good health, will have been bigger than the number of lives saved from COVID. So I think you do have to be careful to look at the balance here between what are you achieving from a lockdown? And clearly there are things you achieve from a lockdown, but you do also have to look at the costs. And it's not unreasonable to ask the government to bring forward the information on both sides of that equation, imperfect though that information will be, to ask members of parliament to take a balanced judgment about what the right steps to take are. That's frankly all we've ever argued for. And I think the government's got better at sharing that information than it has been in the past. And I think it's right for members of parliament to continue asking these questions, because I think we owe it to our constituents as we take these decisions that have such tremendous impacts on lives and livelihoods and future prospects for both.